Thank you, Josh and Trent. Man, it's hard to follow up with that, eh? That's good stuff. Hello to so many of you at home. Yeah, COVID's back again in this way. I'm so glad we can still meet with those who are here this morning and also those at home. We're so glad that we're connected by the Holy Spirit. Welcome back to the Mark series. It's a new year. We are in chapter 10 after taking a break for Christmas. So let's do a quick recap. Mark, who is also known in the book of Acts as John Mark, was a scribe that worked with Peter and Paul. Mark was the first to write down the story of Jesus in what we call a gospel. And his primary source was Peter. Incidentally, why there is no birth narrative story in Mark is because Peter wasn't there for it. So he doesn't share about it. And we're told about the purpose of this book in the very first verse. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And the rest of the book sets out to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. The first six chapters are about miracles, miracles only the Messiah could do, such as casting out demons, healing the sick, enabling the paralyzed to walk, making food out of thin air, and even raising a girl who is dead back to life. All the while, the religious leaders and the secular leaders became more and more fearful of Jesus, and they, who were mortal enemies, they hated each other, actually united to try to stop Jesus. We're seeing that rising up at this point as we step into the story. That, if you know any context, is even crazier than Democrats and Republicans in the United States uniting on something today. And then Jesus does something completely unexpected after chapter 6. He starts going out to the others, and that is preaching the good news to both the Samaritans and even more dramatic, the Gentiles. Those first nine chapters are 99% of the ministry time of Jesus. Now, these last eight chapters are about the last two weeks of Jesus' ministry. And that is where we're at. And Mark is not alone in writing in this style. When John wrote his gospel 40, almost 50 years after this, when he was about to die of old age, 70% of the book of John is about the last two weeks of Jesus' ministry. And Mark really focuses on Jesus' teachings in the next while. He still does miracles, but he focuses on what people, especially the disciples, need to know before he's to go to the cross. Remember, this is all hindsight for us. We know he's going to the cross. The disciples didn't know. And that is where we're at. Jesus teaching a whole bunch of incredibly important truths with the focus on his disciples, which is who we are. We're his disciples. So a lot of this really applies personally to us over the next few weeks. Ernie will be reading to us this passage now. It is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. Thanks, Ernie. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Thank you, Ernie. So how do we get to this part of the passage we're studying today? As we've been going through our series, we're going through one whole chapter each week. So, of course, we can't possibly get through all what's taught in the chapter. My goal, again, is that you would want to read the chapter for yourself, to study it. And my goal is to give you a a feast within that. So what did we miss? Well, Jesus just taught on divorce and remarriage. And we saw the story about how people bring their young children to Jesus to be blessed, and how the disciples tried to shoo them away, to which Jesus angrily reacts, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these as these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Two events that we need to note as we come into this passage. Jesus is coming down hard on the Pharisees because they are abusing the laws of Moses. One of the ways that the law can be abused is by people in power. In this particular case, it's men in power looking for loopholes. That's what legalism does. They look for ways to game the system. See, the Pharisees were letting the Roman Greek culture infiltrate into their own culture, where they saw it as their role to rule over women, and they, they, they twisted the Scripture into allowing them to have authority that was never intended in a marriage. It was a ruling over, like a thumb pressing down. In this case, they had twisted Scripture to allow husbands to simply say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and then cast their wife out, and then that wife was forced into prostitution to survive. And then they would say, oh, look, my wife is an adulteress. I can remarry. Jesus flips it around on the side and says, you're the adulterer, not your wife who you divorced. And Jesus, then after talking to the disciples with the children, who are they most concerned about? They're concerned about people of authority and power, and and Jesus is more concerned about the oppressed, the children. And Jesus gets upset with them. Why is he upset with them? They've been with him for three years at this point, and they still see the way the world sees things, not the way that he sees them. That's important for us to note as we come into this story. Jesus is trying to help his disciples, you and me, have the same heart that he has. That's what it means to be a growing disciple. So now we have this young man. In the passage we just read, it just says a young man. In Mark, he's got, he's the only, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have all three. Mark doesn't mention that he's a rich young ruler. That's mentioned in Matthew. Now, stop and think about that for a second. Why would Matthew point that out so quickly? Because he was the tax collector. He noticed the wealthy. He himself had been one of the wealthy. And 
what does it mean to be rich? Well, rich, that's a term that, that is hard for us to comprehend in that culture. Uh, rich could simply mean that we have a roof over our heads, we have three meals a day, and we're not worried when are we going to eat next. If that's you, by the world standards, you're rich. In this time, though, if you are rich, that means you owned land. How did this young man come to possess and own land at this time? Well, he probably inherited it. Maybe he was wise with the inheritance he had, developed it, was able to buy more. Um, he's presented in a positive way. Ruler, well, it's simply, according to commentaries I read, simply one side of ruler could be that if you're a landowner, you have people that work under you, so you rule over them. So if you have employees, you're a ruler of them in a sense, especially in that culture. The other side, though, is he most likely was a leader in the local synagogue. It does not mention him as rabbi, but it mentions him as a ruler. The man Jarius, who I talked about Oh, probably almost two months ago. That's the one who Jesus, he rose that man's daughter from the dead. He was a leader in the synagogue, not mentioned again, rabbi. He probably gave oversight to the local synagogue in the area that Jesus grew up in, Capernaum. That was the largest synagogue nearby. This man was probably in that same category, but it was unusual for him as a young man to be in that level of authority. You would think by looking at the outside, this is exactly the type of person the disciples and Jesus would be excited about coming and saying, how do I follow God? But Jesus sees things differently. Just stop and think about it. We see this story over and over again. The most famous is in the story of the of when Samuel goes to uh, anoint the next king. And God says, go to Jesse's family. He has seven sons, and he brings out all the seven older sons, and God rejects them all to be king. And, and Samuel's like, what? That makes no sense. And God says, I don't look on what is on the outside. I look on what is on the inside. And when David came, Samuel saw what God saw. So, Jesus sees people differently than you and I do. I would have been just like the other disciples. Oh, this is exactly the type of person we want in our group. How does it show up, though, that we see this man's heart? Well, it's in his first word by he says the word good. I might say, what? Good is a loaded word. There are two types of good. Large G capital G good and small g good. And the understanding of the difference between these two is critical in our salvation. There are lots and lots of things that are small g good. My dog, for the most part, when I wrote this on Friday, she was good, but then she was bad on Saturday. But she's mostly good. My dog's good. Um, A&W, they make good hamburgers. Toyota makes good cars. Mark Shifley for the Winnipeg Jets, he's a good hockey player. Small g good applies to lots of things. It's actually a sign of an emotionally healthy person to be able to tell the difference between good and bad in their own life and the environment around them. But when it comes to large g good, there is only one good, and that is God. That is what Jesus is saying effectively in verse 18. That is a truth that the world finds hard to comprehend. And because, I say this again, we swim in a culture, we in the church don't always comprehend. This is what this young man did not comprehend. Let me tell you a story about a young man that I've been walking with for many years in my previous church. His parents were remarried, and his mom and stepdad were newer Christians who were striving to grow in their newfound faith. I really respected them in their attempt to display Christ to their children and their extended family. They were a great witness in the community. The young man, though, did not completely grasp, he's the youngest son, the only one still living at home, what had happened in his parents' life. He wanted to live life for himself, 
drinking, partying, womanizing. Yeah, I know that's a dated word, but I don't really know how else to explain what he was doing. Anyway, he got himself into a heap of trouble. He, he tried to stand on the fence between following God and following however he wanted. And this got him into a heap of trouble that he had been hitting on a gang member, his girlfriend. And they caught him in the act. So they grabbed him, they roughed him up, they threw him into a house, and they, they extorted money out of him. He could get his maximum $600 out of the bank. So they took him to the bank with guys surrounding him, threatening them they'll beat him up if he doesn't do what they say, and, and he gets the money out, and then they decide they're going to hold him for another day to get another 600 bucks the next day. And during that night, they had taken his clothes, and he was just in his stocking feet and underwear, and, and they had him in a house, and he escaped out the window in minus 30 in just his socks and underwear. And I went to court with him over this. He didn't want to go with his parents because he was deeply embarrassed by it. I sat through the court proceedings, and afterwards the judge looked him in the eye and said, after they found the defendants guilty of extortion and threatening, and he said, young man, you escaped so luckily with so little ramifications. I'm so glad to see you here with your pastor. You guys need to have a talk on the way home about turning your life around. I'm like, wow, that's a good judge. So on the way home, well, it was actually back to his work because I had picked him up. It was about 20, 25 minute drive back to work. Uh, I was driving him back and we talked and he said uh, on the way back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give God another chance. I'm going to pray. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's great. Let's pray. So while he was praying, he actually said this. Now I'm paraphrasing. He said, God, so I'm driving. I don't have my eyes closed when I'm driving and we're praying. He says, God, I'm going to give you another chance. I stopped. I'm like, what? We're going to try this out again, God, for the next six months. But here's my deal, God. If I follow you, I want a better job, a nicer car, and a girlfriend. I, I've never heard such a thing. Although it was honest, I stopped the car a kilometer away from his work in a parking lot. I remember it so clear. It was a hunting and fishing store. And I said, get out of my car. He said, what? Get out of the car. He said, why? I said, you're a rebel. And, and you're going to stand before God and say, hey, I'm going to negotiate with you. Get out of the car. And I made him walk, walk the last kilometer. I've never done that before or since. Jesus saw this type of man in the rich young ruler. Let's read on what Jesus says. But to answer your question, you know the commands. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat on anyone. Honor your father and mother. Jesus first points him towards the laws of Moses. And these things that Jesus points to are common sense things that any Jew at that time would know. And this is how the man responds. Teacher, the man replied, I obeyed all these commands since I was young. The young man thought he was large, G, good. One of our problems we face in our society today is that people think they're large, G, good. I'm good. They're actually told this over and over again. There are no bad people. There's only bad decisions. But that is not the Bible teaches. We are not large, G, good. Yes, every single one of us has small, G, good in us. That comes with just simply being made in God's image. But we're broken. There's something inherently wrong with us. If, if there wasn't, Jesus wouldn't have come, lived, died again, and rose again. He wouldn't have gone to the cross. If, if there's something not radically broken with us, Jesus wouldn't have come. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, We're all infected and impure with sin. We all display our righteous deeds, but they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sin sweeps us away like the wind. That's the Old Testament, you might say. But what about the New Testament? John. John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Paul, Romans chapter 3, 23. 
For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But before you get upset with me, let me tell you another story. One that I witnessed wreck ministries over the year if we leave it there. Because that is a temptation for people to leave it there. Um, about 16, almost 17 years ago on YouTube was this, when YouTube was a brand new thing. Do you guys remember that? You'd wait for YouTube to buffer and then it would do that little circly thing forever and wait forever. There was a shocking message by Paul Washer. That's the name of the preacher out there. And it was really popular among youth pastors. And it was a, a gentleman who was a missionary to Peru, I think, who got up and for an hour shouted at a group of youth at a youth convention how they were all terrible sinners and he ripped them to shreds. And then he left them there. What? When I was a youth pastor in Winnipeg, at the time that that was popular, that video being shown by people, I was given the task by the denomination, by the conference minister, to go and sit with this new young youth pastor in rural Manitoba and, and try to help him out and understand what's going wrong. He had just started at this church and he'd only been there for a few months and nobody was coming to youth. And after meeting with him the very first time, he told me about his first youth retreat and he proceeded to do the exact same thing with his youth group. Told everybody, you're all sinners and you're lost and you have no hope. And he left them with that. Thinking, ah, I'm going to hook them and, and, and teach them a lesson somehow. And the most ridiculous, crazy thing happened. Uh, one of the young ladies in the youth ministry, who was in grade 11, started a shadow youth ministry on the same night that youth was at at the church, at her house, and everybody came to her youth group. Incidentally, she's now one of my ministry partners in Multiply in Myanmar and Thailand, and we had a good laugh and shake our head and sadness about it, driving through the mountains of Myanmar, listening to that, talking about that story. And she said, I did things wrong, but boy, you can't leave somebody there. So don't worry, we're not going to leave you there because Jesus doesn't leave us lost either. But here's an important truth that you have to remember. Jesus started out his ministry with a call to repentance. That's the first message Jesus preached in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Repent because you're not good. You're broken and you need fixed. And Jesus proceeds to go on and prove the rest of his ministry that only he, the Messiah, can fix you. Let me read verse 21 that makes my heart so happy when I read. Jesus looked at the man. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Jesus loved him so much that he told him the truth accept him where he's at, but wouldn't leave him there. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus felt genuine love for him. Jesus loved this young man exactly where he was at, and he told him the truth, even when it was hard truth. Jesus goes right after the matter. He says, you have an idol in your life, and until you deal with that idol, you aren't going to follow me. And what was this man's idol? Well, it was his wealth. The problem was this young man was not willing to give up that idol at that time, which was the root of his pride. At this, the young man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And Jesus chased him down, convinced him to come back, and everybody lived happily ever after. Right? No. The story doesn't end that way. Instead, he sits down with his disciples and says these words, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. There's much discussion online what this figure of speech 
that Jesus said meant. It's one of those things that has sort of gotten lost to history. We have some thoughts of what it could be, but, but hyperbole sometimes gets lost in translation and in history. So sort of like saying, um, my mom's pantry has enough in it to feed an army for a week. Oh, no, wait a minute, that's sort of true, ha, huh, mom? <laughs> okay, but you know what I mean. So what it could have meant was that, that I've been to Jerusalem. They talk about the, the camel's gate. That's a gate at the side of the city where there's a, a big gate during the day um, where you can walk right through, but it also has a smaller door in it, and the camel could get through if you unloaded it and went through, but we don't know that for sure. We do know that the disciples understood what it meant, though. That it's a really, really hard thing. Jesus wasn't making a joke. He was saying a saying that everybody understood. So, what do we do with that? I want another story that will illustrate this. In my second year as lead pastor in Saskatchewan, I had one of the local grads at a local conservative Bible college preach a message. He was a member of our church. And this was the passage that he wanted to preach on, the one that we're studying right now. I didn't think anything of it. He, I was glad to have the Sunday off. He did good in school, and I didn't ask to read the message beforehand. And he actually ended with the sermon with this verse. So who can be saved? And then he started to weep, and he walked off the stage and said, who can be saved? Again, I want to say we're not being left there, praise God. What do we have? Well, here's one of the dangers of reading scriptures out of context, isn't it? Let me go back to those passages that I just read a few moments ago to point out that we are not large C good. Let me read the rest of them. Verse John, verses 1, verse 8 and 9. If we claim to have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Romans 3, 23 and 24, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet, verse 24, God in his grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when He freed us from the penalty of sin. And it goes on for for many more verses talking about the work that Jesus does to save us because He loves us so much. Do you see the Jesus loved the man. Jesus loves you. And even Isaiah. The Isaiah treaties. You know, we just heard earlier where Isaiah says, All your good deeds are like filthy rags. But this is the conclusion after all of those verses of of Isaiah saying, Israel, God's people, look what you're doing. This is God's conclusion, what he says to them. And I will answer them even before they call me. While they're still talking about their needs, I will have gone ahead and answered their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. And it goes on to talk about what heaven will look like. Jesus says this. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. This is talking about to be saved. But not with God. With everything, it is possible with God. Wow, if there's any verse that I want you to remember from this message, it is this. Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. And then, of course, we come to Peter. Remember, he's the main source of this. He probably read this and laughed. Yep, yep, that's me. What does Peter speak up and say? We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Now, was that exactly the case? Or was Peter thinking more highly of himself? Let's go back to the second sermon in this series. When Peter and the other first, there were first four disciples called, they were all fishermen. What did Jesus do before they became disciples? They cast their nets and they filled their boat to the point that it was sinking with fish. 
and they came back to shore, and, G- and Peter threw himself down and said, my Lord, my God, I'll follow you. Why? He just gave them three years' wage worth of fish. And now we're at year three. And Peter is thinking, not about that anymore. He's thinking, we're probably getting close to running out of money at home, aren't we? Because Peter was married. I've given up everything. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus take care of your family for those three years? But how quickly do we forget? I am so Peter. I'm so thankful to read about Peter in this light. Peter is clearly thinking about money here. The rich young ruler is clearly thinking about money here. How will God provide for me if I fully follow him? Who here hasn't answered, asked that question? But listen to Jesus' answers. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with, and along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are now the greatest will be the least important, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. So what has he promised? He's promised the church. He's actually not promising you're going to be really wealthy. He's promised them you'll be part of the family of God. Look at this. You will now have many houses, our homes together, our church, brothers and sisters, that's who we are, mothers, children, property, but we'll also have persecution. That is what he promises them. The church and persecution to come. But he also promises them heaven because he knew what Isaiah had said heaven looks like. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest among them. So now what? First of all, it's so important for us to be reminded as we're reminded in this passage. There are no large G good in any of us. We are all in need of a Savior. And this is the foundational starting point when we come to people and share the good news. We share the good news that Jesus saved me from myself. And if you don't recognize that, you fall into the same trap as the rich young ruler. But then again, the disciples did too, didn't they? We all have idols in our lives. We all need that we all need to give up daily, hourly in order to fully follow Jesus. What are they for you? Well, in this passage it's pretty clear it's how we treat money. We treat money like it's ours instead of treating it like it's God's. But here's another great truth. You will not be able to give up those idols yourself. You will not be able to save yourself, but with God, all things are possible. This can be done with the inworking of the Holy Spirit, inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives to transform us and to change us day by day, step by step, into being more and more like Jesus. And we do it in community with the church. This is actually one of the most important reasons why we meet together, to encourage each other, to act as family, to look after each other, to challenge each other, to encourage each other. And last of all, remember that Jesus loves you so much that he's not willing to leave you where you are at. And that includes in your sin. Just like he did with the disciples in the New Testament, he is all about transformation And that includes transformation to make you look like Him. And that is what we do as a church together. Last week, David Weeb concluded the service with a really great prayer. I'm adding just one more paragraph to that. So bow with me for a word of prayer. In a world of fault lines and fractures, we stand in a place where opposites can come together, awaiting the birth of what is to come. If you are doubting, 
welcome. If you are healing, welcome. If you are angry at injustice, welcome. We await a new beginning. One more beginning in a series of starts, trailing backwards in time to the very first day. If you are afraid, welcome. If you are joyful, welcome. If you are longing for belonging, welcome. God's generous rhythm of life, death, resurrection, moving in and all through things, the very breath and source of the cosmos itself. Our pathways converge and continue each one of us as a catalyst for loving action. And thank you so much for not leaving us where we are at. For being the image bearers, transforming us into your image, day by day, minute by minute, year by year, making us into who you intend us to be. We, the community of saints, conspire, breathe with us. Amen. Worship team, if you can come up and conclude.